Hey you, I'm Andy Powell. Welcome to the Allcast Podcast. No topic is off the table. I hope you enjoy. Today's guest is Jessie Saboter. Her testimony is extensive and intense. Fasten your seatbelts for this one. It involves many graphic topics, some of them in detail. I have listened to nearly 20 hours of this woman's testimony from different sources and shows. It involves the Luciferian Brotherhood cult and the abuse that goes along with that system. Jesse was in it and was delivered from it. Now to share her experiences and help others who have escaped that system in their processing. Some of these topics are fringe and hard to believe. There are no prerequisites for listening to this podcast episode or any episode that I have, um, but a lot of this inv- involves um, spiritual belief systems, particularly belief in the Christian purview of the world, good and evil, God and the devil, spiritual warfare, the unseen realms, things like that. If those things are not comfortable for you, then this may not be the episode for you. But if you're curious and do have some level of belief in something that's greater than us, maybe sit through it and uh, open your ears. The fact is, there's a depth of evil in this world that most of us cannot contend with, cannot comprehend, and most of us are unwilling to look at and acknowledge. We know about child sex trafficking. We know about rape, murder, mass slavery, and cobalt mines in the Congo. We know of the oppression in places like China and North Korea, thanks to people like Yi Yeonmi Park and her testimony. We have heard of these evils, but mostly they seem far away, unless you've experienced it in your own life. Today, we're here to look at that evil to acknowledge its existence, and to hear from somebody who has lived among it. If we are to defeat our enemy, any enemy, it is best that we know as much as we can about that enemy. If you have any questions about this episode or about Jesse, there are links in the show notes, and you can email me at theallcastinbox at gmail.com. This episode is brought to you by Black Flag Hybrid Grappling in Glendale, Arizona. The Arizona Catch Wrestling Championship is on Sunday, March 19th, 2023. This tournament welcomes all academies and combat styles to compete under catch wrestling rules. Sign up today to engage in healthy, friendly combat. If you don't train, go train. I'm Andy. Welcome aboard the AllCast. Brace yourself. All right, there we there we are. <clears throat> Hey, Jesse, how are you today? Great. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Um, so welcome to uh, the podcast. I've got uh, way more questions than we have time for, unfortunately. Um, but we'll just kind of go with the flow and uh, I'll start us off with a prayer and um, go from there. Sounds good. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for um, uh, making this meeting possible and for bringing Jesse out of the um, difficult obstacles that she has overcome in her life. And I uh, thank you for bringing her to the point of being willing and obedient and sharing her testimony for those who need to hear it and for those who will be affected and moved by it. And I ask that you will guide this conversation so that it falls upon the ears of those who need to hear it and that it will be moved through us by you, God and um, make your Holy Spirit known and present for your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, Jesse, um, how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Zebotar? Saboter. Saboter. Okay, <laughs> yep. right on. All right. So, if you could just give a quick brief bring in people up to speed who have never heard maybe like a three-minute blurb. What do All you right, we'll do our her? best to make it three minutes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I, can, I can interrupt if I need to. <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I'm what you would consider uh, born into the bloodline families of the Luciferian Brotherhood Occult. Um, so, you know, as a beginning out as a child, my families appeared to just be regular Christian families. My father's side was part of the Lutheran Church and 
you know, casually attended. My mother's side was part of the Jesuit Catholic Church and were devoted to attending Mass every day. But that side of my family also held the secret and in guise of their Christian life, they really were part of this Luciferian Brotherhood. Um, my family members on that side are very high level within that system. And if we begin to just basically break down that system, um, if you think of a triangle, at the very top you have what we call five women that are called the five mothers of darkness uh, that run that system for uh, Lucifer or Satan. And uh, one of those women was a um, woman I called my proctor, which meant that it was her job to train me into that system and raise me up into that position. Um, underneath them, you have a term that some people might have heard, which is the Satanic Council or the Druidic Council. And that's made up of members of finances, world leaders, uh, politicians, bloodline family members like the Rothschilds. Within that, uh, like the Bilderbergs, uh, the EU, um, who are part of the New World Order, or the Nazi regime, it's all interconnected. Um, so that's the system that I grew up into. Um, you know, a term that we may not use a lot is satanic ritual, but um, that is what I experienced through uh, the Brotherhood. And... Um, you know, part of my experience was not just all satanic or into uh, our government and the military where um, we experienced different things through the military. Uh, they had projects, experiments, uh, things like um, the Looking Glass, Star Wars Now, the Voice of God project. And within that, they'll have a lot of children that are engaged in those things. And... Um, you know, training them to operate spiritual gates uh, and to operate within the spirit world in psychological warfare through the U.S. military. Um, so this is a, it really is a worldwide organization. And um, all of that was what I was brought into. But before that happened, I want to bring out that the Lord and his goodness, you know, foresees all things. And when I was two years old, um, he had us move in with one of our family members who were true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they began to take me and my mother to church and uh, witness to us. And I can remember the first time I was in church and this little Mexican woman named Lily sat me in her lap, opened up her Bible, and began to read to me from the book of John. Um, she continued to equip and prepare me without even knowing that was what she was doing, by just reading to me straight from scripture and teaching me uh, little Bible songs. And so, you know, a year and a half after I came to Christ at age three, um, that is when my occultic training began. So. Mm -hmm. Right on. Okay. That's I know a that's a that lot. Really that's is. a big yeah. nutshell. <laughs> to, yeah, that's okay. Undo. That's okay. That's, that's where I wanted to get somebody who's never heard of you kind of up to speed and so that they can understand where the questions are coming from that I'm going to ask. As yeah. far as the, uh, the military, you said they use a lot of children in these types of experiments and stuff. Where do they acquire those children from? They're not volunteers, I imagine. No, there's, there's several different ways um, that they acquire the children. Within the system, there's two types of children. You have the hierarchy children, who are those that are born in their considered bloodline, and they're chosen for certain positions within the system. Then you have the children that they consider the expendable children. Um, those are the children that they use as assets uh, to make money off of, usually through sexual exploitation, uh, satanic ritual murders and cannibalism. So um, the expendable children, they can get anywhere. Um, you know, those are going to be children that um, may have come through kidnapping. Um, they may have come through the kidnapping that's happening through the CPS system. They also could come through uh, what we call the underground breeder programs that the system runs where uh, they have mass amount of children that they have, um, you know, gotten through their breeding programs that 
you know, basically have no birth certificate, no death certificate. Um, they're bred like cattle and um, they use those children however they want. So that uh, the underground breeding programs and CPS, so child protective services is what CPS is. And most people understand that mm -hmm. to be the people who come when there's domestic violence and there's some issue in the home and the child is being neglected, et cetera. So Correct. through, through the child pr protective services program, there are um, each year, there are like a few hundred thousand children that disappear through that program after being taken by cps yeah. those children disappear and um and right and it's large amounts of number i believe for this past year um the reported number of children that are still missing from cps um is eight hundred thousand. so it, it's a large number of children so that's just in the united states that's just in the united states okay as far as an underground breeding program um, is this something where there's like places that do in vitro fertilization and you have like, uh, people will breed dogs, right? So they'll keep the mother and then they'll keep a, a stud dog so that they just do litter after litter after litter. Is it something like that? Or is it like in vitro fertilization where they're, they're impregnating these moms with DNA they have stored in a bank somewhere? How does that work? Usually not the later, um, from my experience experience in childhood, um, it, the breeder programs were directly connected with the Jesuit Catholic Church. Um, they would impregnate girls that were chosen um, to be mothers for the breeder programs um, around the equinoxes, so spring and fall. Those could be girls that went to private schools, um, girls that, you know, they, they had underground already that um, you know, are part of the generational lines of those who are undocumented. And then they will induce labor at about uh, six months of pregnancy around the. And, um, you know, with that, it's just, I guess there's really no way to explain the exact workings of it. Um, you know, but my experience was that, you know, it happened in Chicago, Illinois, was where I experienced it, as well as in the Wisconsin areas. And, um, you know, I would see things like, because it was connected with the underground areas, you not only had the Catholic Church, but you had also connections to military bases. And, um, you know, I can just remember rooms that were like, almost like big hallways um, where they would have beds lined along both sides of the room, they would bring the girls in and they would be there, you know, for a couple of days until they delivered and they would be delivering many infants at one time. Um, and then, you know, because it was connected with um, the Nazi regime as well and the scientists who came over through Project Paperclip and Aerodynamic, um, you know, eyewitness Nazi nurses that would be taking care of the babies that were born. And, there, you know, I just remember a mass room with, like, I don't know if anybody has seen those old church cribs where they've got the little rail things that lift up and close down. But it would have rows on the walls of cribs that were stacked on top of each other built into the walls. And there would be multiple infants in each of those. Um, and they would have people that would... Um, be taking care of them some of them but then there were other children that oh excuse me, <coughs> oh, excuse me that uh, they didn't uh, take care of so it just depended on as those infants were born what they were chosen for some from the moment they were born uh, literally would be thrown into a bucket and uh, disposed of others you know they would put into those rooms with cribs and that was just the one breeder program that I witnessed that at. So not every one of them was built the same or operated in the same way. And to be clear, you saw this in person with your own eyes. Yes. How yeah. old were you when you saw this? Um, it was in 1981 to 80. Um, well, it went beyond 84, but my major experience at those breeder programs was till 84 
And so that was age four and a half to about age seven. And was this being shown to you or was this something that you were expected to be a part of in some capacity? Uh, My job that I was chosen for in the system was to understand how the entire system operated and to be able to oversee and run the, um, the system as I took my position. So right on. Okay. Um, that brings me to one of the other things. If you could just uh, kind of briefly rattle off some of the things that you have witnessed, because a lot of these things people will hear briefly and and then throw it away because it sounds ridiculous. But some of the things that I've heard from listening to several hours of audio of your testimony is things like um, uh, murder, uh, ritual sacrifice, cannibalism, things like that. Mm-hmm. What beyond those things have you witnessed in person? And if you could, if you care to share anything specific about those. Yeah. Um, again, I experienced these things to the extreme. So very graphic Um, It would be things like rape, uh, torture was a big one, um, that included torture of uh, children as young as uh, newborn or children even in the womb. Um, I experienced things with adrenochrome, Um, so things like both, um, like I learned the ancient methods for procurement, Um, as well as making the tinctures of adrenochrome that would be used. Um, They used a certain formula for it uh, so that, you know, let me go back a little bit. They would test each person or each child in the system as they came into the system so that they knew how much adrenochrome you could take on a regular basis to heighten your spiritual acuity without going into a psychosis. So it would be used to heighten your spiritual awareness and acuity. But then you they would have other tinctures of adrenochrome that would be used during ritual times when they wanted to ritually sacrifice um, that they would take and that would make them, you know, pretty much in a crazy psychosis. Um, I experienced... Um, abuse through the u.s military and that involved uh, spiritual gates that involved um, different military departments like uh, the department of defense uh, the dia uh, where you know they would use our spiritual gifts and uh, basically i've used the term they weaponized us as children they bought sold and traded children as spiritual weapons for war Um, I also experienced um, other things that, uh, you know, I guess are just too, there's some things that are too graphic to get into. Uh, The cannibalism was one of those things, along with um, the different ways that they would kill individuals. I experienced things like um, them turning um, the remains of uh, those that they killed into diamonds Uh, They would put their bodies into the incinerators that were in the Catholic churches. And uh, that's part of how the Vatican got its wealth, um, is by buying, selling, and trading um, the children that they ritually killed as diamonds on the black market. Um, A lot of the witchcraft stuff that I, you know, so different forms of witchcraft, sorcery, divination that I experienced, um, I, in my testimonies, I talk about some of my teachers in that system. Uh, one of my main teachers was an, was the Nazi Michael Karkok. Uh, he was the Legion of Defense leader, um, Ukrainian Legion of Defense leader for Hitler. And he came over um, through, uh, we'll just say he came over after the war into the United States and was stationed in that um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois area. Um, his job was to teach me defense methods to also teach how to uh, connect with the military and use and operate the different spiritual gates as well as different forms of defense magic and um, different art forms of black magic. Um, I had individuals like Lori Cabot Kent, who was my main um uh, we'll say witchcraft, sorcery, divination teacher. Um, so things like, you know, learning how to procure the adrenochrome. She was one of the people who knew that method. 
um, you know, she did more, I would say, taught more light side things, so of the system. And it, the system has two sides, a dark side and a light side. The dark side focuses more on what we call black magic, um, which is used for harm or destruction. Um, and then you have the light side of the system, which focuses more on white forms of magic or magic that's used for good um, for humanity. And it, with both sides, you do have mass amounts of wickedness and evil, but the wickedness comes out in different forms. So in the light side, you know, there's members there that really have no clue of the horrific atrocities that the dark side commits with um, sexual sins and crimes against children. But yet you have some of those light side members that I experienced as a child covering up those crimes that people would commit. So, um, so I had experiences... These... So some of these people that are that are involved in the Luciferian Brotherhood cult on the light side of that system, they may be a part of it. They may be operating in some capacity, but not necessarily be fully aware of what it is that they're supporting or doing. So they're deceived and manipulated as as well as, you know, the next guy. Right. Somewhat. Um, so like an example would be some of those members of the light side. Um, they, you know, they would financially fund, um, you know, and would oversee like the different policies, procedures, regulations for some of the um, government military experiments that we were in. And, you know, when they would come to see, they would get this display that looked like, yeah, you know, these children are being <laughs> embedded and they're going to be really productive members of society and they would give their approval and say yes this is an amazing program we're going to continue funding but then they would not even know that behind the scenes what they weren't seeing is that some of those children um, were being sexually exploited in sex magic in order to open spiritual gates um, you know they wouldn't see the the dark magic that went on behind the scenes um, you know, some of us children, we would be trained, you know, in heavy combat forms. And, you know, as we received injuries, these people would come and would bring healing to those injuries so that even if we would go home and try to tell, you know, that something was happening to us, there was no sign or, um, you know, nothing that we could show as proof that we had just, you know, had the hell beat out of us and, uh, you know, that we had been hurt and injured and, you know, they would remove or cover up the proofs that we had. And, uh, you know, part of it was their push for virtue where, you know, you were expected to comply and be what they called a good girl or a good child in the system. And, yeah. Okay. Um, so you've mentioned def defense and uh, war and heavy combat and things like that. So when you're saying those things, are you referring to all spiritual engagement of these things, like spiritual battle? Spiritual battle, yes. Okay. Um, against top demonic um, and we'll say demonic principalities. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. And. Um, as far as opening a spiritual gate, now what exactly, you know, without giving us the like instruction manual to do that, what, how does that, <laughs> how does that look and what's the purpose of it? They can look different based on where the spiritual gate is. If people have seen shows like the Stargate or uh, the last Indiana Jones, um, those show spiritual gates. And these are real gates that God has created. Uh, they're talked about in scripture. The first place is in the book of Genesis. And then also we hear about them in Job, as well as in the Psalms. Um, in the book of Job, he describes the, um, the gates, the floodgates that were below the earth and above the earth. And in the book of Genesis, we see that you know, due to the wickedness of the Nephilim and the fallen angels that were um, having offspring with women and 
coming down and teaching women sorcery, divination, and witchcraft, um, the Lord in his anger opened those floodgates and they released their water. So what happened after that was that, you know, these floodgates are real access points. Um, you know, some of them, the larger ones, operate, um, you know, vertically, like an elevator where you can go up into the heavenly realms and you can go down into the lower realms that are below the earth um, in the spirit world. Uh, the ones that operate horizontally uh, pretty much operate from a point A to a point B. So our military has mapped out these different gates and, um, you know, are very use those spiritual gates and the spirit world in warfare. Okay. Uh, is there any kind of known project in the military that cites these mappings? Um, I don't know if they detail the mappings, but yes, there's many projects that um, interface with the spiritual gates. Uh, CERN is one of those. Um, we work uh, we worked hand in hand with CERN. Um, you can look up Spro uh, Project Scenante, S C. Yep, S C A N T um, A N T E. I think Scenante. And then um, that project later, they changed the name to the Star Wars project or the Stargate project. And from there, it broke down into three major projects. It became the Looking Glass project, uh, Star Wars Now project, as well as um, the Voice of God project. Uh, within that, you also have some others like the Phoenix Project and Flame Grill. Um, those went further into projects like the Jedi Project and the First Earth Battalion projects. And the later, uh, the First Earth Battalion, were under um, what is called the Global Federation in the system, or also some people may have heard of its newer name, which is the Galactic Federation. And um, that works alongside of our new military uh, group that's been established, Space Force. No kidding. Okay. All right. Um, as far as the name of the Luciferian Brotherhood cult, uh, uh, most people have heard of Lucifer. Most people have heard of a cult and a brotherhood. Is this the same as the Illuminati or is the Illuminati a branch of it? Yeah, they have many, many names, and they do branch off based on, um, we'll say, authority, jurisdiction, and, you know, which part of the Brotherhood program they're in. So, you know, the best way to describe it is that their overall names that they usually use would be things like, you know, the Deep State, the Cabal, the Illuminati, um, but not all brotherhood are part of the Illuminati. Um, they also have different departments. So they have the Jesuit Catholic department. They have the Masonic, the Mormon, the Kabbalah, um, and the Satanist departments. Um, so it depends, you know, which part of the system they're connected with. So this um, is the, like a, this is like a corporation with sub companies. And that's CEOs why I call it a system. Each. Okay. Yeah, at the very top, you're going to have two main groups. Uh, you're going to have the Order of the Phoenix and the Order of the Golden Dawn. And the highest members of those groups in the Brotherhood are going to be part of the Order of Melchizedek, who are considered the true priests um, of God. And this is different. You know, it's a different Order of Melchizedek and priesthood of Melchizedek than what scripture tells us about, you know, that the, we have a true priesthood of Melchizedek, which is under our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So they have a mock version of that, and that's what they call their highest members within that system. So how does one differentiate the two? Well, simply because, you know, those who are part of the true order of Melchizedek um, acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and acknowledge his death and his resurrection. Uh, those in the order of Melchizedek, 
they see themselves as that high priest and they see themselves as gods who live forever. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, as far as these spiritual gates, what, uh, what's the purpose of opening up a spiritual gate and where do these gates go? You said vertically, you can go to um, heaven realm. Correct. Or, or, or to hell realm or the lower, the lower, realm. It, it, uh, not necessarily hell. There's lower uh, spiritual realms. Um, so I often describe like the realms as, you know, almost like a, a chess board where you have that middle uh, board if you were to stack, you know, chess boards five high and have spaces in between, um, that w is pretty much how you would experience the realms. And within that, you know, you've got different planes that you can move around on and the different, those different realms um, and your movement upon those realms. Um, with that, you know, why do they want access to the gates? Well, all of these um, fallen angels have been cast out of heaven. And, you know, they all together agree on one point with, with Lucifer or Satan. And that is that they want to help him usurp the throne of God. Because Lucifer wants to be God and proclaim himself as God. So... Their goal behind, you know, operating the spiritual gates is to keep us from entering into that kingdom of heaven and fulfilling our, our priestly duties. You know, they don't want us to know that we have access to that. And they definitely don't want us going into the courts of heaven, you know, learning about our authority that we have in Christ. Um, they want to keep us where they have control. And, you know, at the same time, they want to connect each human that they can with a demonic general or demonic host because those demons can't use those the vertical spiritual gates to get into heaven because they've been cast out from there. Okay. Uh, the only one who is still allowed permissions is Lucifer. And as scripture said, he's allowed to come and to bring his accusations against us into the courts. So, he has to go before the Lord to ask for sovereign permissions for everything he wants to do. So, you know, they want to get that heaven or those demonic hosts into heaven. And the only way to do that is to have those hosts inhabit a human body and to have those humans understand how to um, maneuver through those spiritual gates to get into heaven. Okay. So, and that's not saying that I do not believe that that's going to happen, mm -hmm. but that is their goal and their agenda. Okay. Um, moving into these uh, spiritual gates or moving through these spiritual gates. Um, you mentioned that Lucifer has to go into the court of heaven and bring accusations against human beings in, in their sin, basically. Right. It's like, can I punish this human based on these sins? Is it something along those lines? And where is that in scripture, if at all? There's a lot of different places that speak about um, him going before the Lord. Um, some of those would be the book of Job uh, within the first few chapters. And then we also see in Zechariah 3. Um, Revelations also speaks about that, which is the last book in scripture. And it's not... You know, it's not quite like that. Um, there's a couple technicalities for Satan. He's, he's temporarily been given authority over the earth, but his generals do not have that authority legally in the courts of heaven to have dominion over the earth because the Lord in Genesis 1 and 2 sets up the authority and the jurisdiction um, over the land and he gives that authority to mankind so part of the issue then is as lucifer comes in and tries to illegally take our authority from us uh, with that he takes our dominion and our ability to rule and reign with the lord here on earth um, he has to fight for those rights and his his legal ground is unrighteousness 
that where there's sin or unrighteousness, he has the legal ground to be in that place. Um, so he wants to go up there. He's going to fight and say, look, here's somebody who's unrighteous. And what's his goal behind that? Then he can say, I now have legal rights to this ground. I'm going to establish places of wickedness because, you know, the true believers are not stepping forward in that place. They're not exercising their authority that you've given them. And he's going to fight for those rights. And, you know, most believers are not even aware that that's what's happening because the church has not taught us about that type of spiritual warfare. That's what I was just going to say. I've never learned that one in church, and it seems like a pretty dang important point. <laughs> it's absolutely important. Yeah. So Okay. Um, I think that's everything right now about spiritual gates. I'm sure I'll have more to come. But going back to adrenochrome, when you first started describing what it does, uh, my first thought is like psychedelics, like magic mushrooms mm -hmm. and other things that open up uh, the internal human to the spiritual realm. Now is adrenochrome similar to those and, or what is the place of psychedelics in the Luciferian brotherhood cult? And what, if any, is the place of those types of plants regarding God and Jesus and what can Jesus and the Holy spirit do with or through those things to help people? Because I mm -hmm. see a lot of people, it seems yeah. like it's helping them a lot. We might have to get back to some of those questions. But um, to start with, um, the system, you know, uses the adrenochrome to give that heightened spiritual acuity or to put somebody into a psychosis. Um, and, you know, the difference between the two is that, you know, that heightened um, spiritual acuity, that's a natural thing. Uh, God created our, our bodies with our adrenal glands to be, you know, to operate in a way where when we're in danger or we feel like something's going on, we're automatically, you know, we'll have more awareness with that hormone. Um, you know, it, it gives you more, um, like by spiritual acuity, you know, it, it opens up that um, sense in our spiritual body and opens up our spiritual senses. Um, just like we have physical senses, you know, we have sight, we have hearing, uh, we have touch, we have taste. Um, it, it opens up our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears in that spirit realm so that, you know, we might not in the physical realm we might not necessarily be aware of other spiritual beings. We might not be able to hear or see them. But when you have that adreno, it automatically makes you more aware of your spiritual senses. So that's what they want to keep open at all times. Um, because, you know, you're not just dealing with the physical world and the occult. You're very much interacting with demonic or other spiritual beings. Um, so in that, you know, they're just awakening those spiritual senses, but they're using it, something natural um, that your body is used to processing. And it's, so it's just the so amount. It's made, so it's, it's a hormone. Adrenochrome is a hormone that already exists. Yeah, it comes the from body. the adrenal glands. Okay. And then they will add hormones to it in some cases, um, like hormones from the pineal gland, um, which then heightens things even more for them. So it's just playing with hormones that your body naturally makes. But what happens in that process is, you know, it really takes an effect on your body because, um, you know, God designed our bodies to naturally react by producing or increasing that hormone. As soon as the danger, you know, is gone, that hormone naturally, you know, balances itself back out and you're just at a normal, um, you know, percentage. But what happens is that, you know, they provide that adreno to your body from an outside source. So then your natural adrenal glands get used to not producing because it, it's used to you getting that supplied amount. Yeah. And so when that happens, it throws off your body 
um, and they become, you know, it becomes something where they have to constantly give themselves that supply every day. If they don't, you know, um, they could go into cardiac arrest because their body just won't produce the right amounts. Um, so they get used to seeking out that extra source and their body, you know, their normal natural adrenos, um, you know, function at a lesser amount during those times and don't, you know, don't react like they should. So those are some of the complications that happen long term as they seek those outside sources. So it is different um, than a psych psychedelic. Uh, psychedelics also can open up that spiritual acuity as well. But with that, you're not going to have as much uh, balance or control because, um, you know, and that's really at the higher levels, they want something more natural um, because they don't want, sorry, hold on. No worries. They don't want, um, like with the psychedelic, your spirit body is very controlled, but in that process, you lose the control of your physical body. And they want to have that full control of both the physical and the spiritual body at the same time. Um, so, you know, the majority of the highest level elite, uh, they aren't necessarily going to use any psychedelics at all because that could mean a loss of power authority or control for them and when that happens you know they're most likely to get attacked by other members of the system who are seeking to usurp their authority and power or you know it leaves them privy to um, the horrific demonic attacks with the demonic generals and um, you know so they're not going to give up that control yeah uh, but you will see a lot of the you know mid to lower levels um, that are looking for something that will quickly take them into um, that spirit world. They may use different forms of psychedelics. Um, you'll get, you know, different, um, you know, witches, warlocks, uh, coven leaders, um, different people within the system who will use that. And, you know, really at the highest level, they don't, you know, they don't use, um, I guess we'll say, you know, those type of heal, even for healing, because they use different forms of witchcraft, uh, primarily forms of blood magic or energy. Um, you know, they're going to do energy manipulation to bring healing at a quantum level. Uh, versus, you know, using something herbal or um, using a form of psychedelic. Um, yet, at the lower levels of the system, you know, you will see um, individuals who are very highly trained in using those things. Like and, Charles Manson? Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was, yeah. He was a part of... Um, um, operation he was part of some cia operation it's all written out in the book called chaos um but mm -hmm. that would be that person would be an example of somebody at the lower levels using a psychedelic to manipulate right. people for evil okay correct yeah okay right on okay well that's great thank you <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> some of my other questions seem silly now that we've talked about some of this stuff <laughs> But um, I guess I'll just start rattling off. Uh, if questions. you've got the question, somebody else <laughs> out there must have it too, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah that's true. So in some of the audio that I've uh, listened to, you name certain people um, as as like being part of the system or have been part of this system. And so I just want to run a couple names by you because um, I could I could put this person in that slot and see it going either way. Mm -hmm. And um I mean, the first one that actually <laughs> I've listened to so many hours of this guy talking and it's Joe Rogan. I love, I love Joe Rogan and what he's done for my generation very, very much. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what do you see as his role in all this? Is he 
do you know anything about him intentionally manipulating the masses or unintentionally or anything along those lines? Um, I'm as far as I'm, you know, familiar, I, I cannot confirm if he's actually in the system. So he's not an individual that I grew up being aware of within that system or in my hierarchy levels. Um, from what I've seen of him, you know, I, I don't necessarily see a lot of evidence of him being interconnected with those I would consider dark side or uh, specifically light side. So, you know, he's one that I really can't confirm whether he's in the system or not on. So right on. cool. Cool. Thank you. And um, another one that you have mentioned before is Elon Musk, a big figure right at this moment in our, in our um, world stage. So will you tell me a little bit about um, what you're familiar with regarding Elon Musk? Yeah. Um, Elon is mentioned in my affidavits uh, that are sealed in the Minnesota courts, as well as um, in some other places and on my pages and stuff. People can find those court uh, references where they can find the documents. You can also go to timothycharlesholmeseth.com. Um, he's the only individual that I've given express uh, permission to be able to publicly release those documents and put them out. So all my affidavits are on his site. Um, also, we've had some people who've taken them off Timothy's site um, and published like uh, Veronica Swift with uh, Lifting the Wool. Um, so I encourage people to look into those. So the stuff that I've, you know, I've brought out how I, I witnessed Elon go through some of the satanic rituals um, that the hierarchy children go through. Uh, from my experience, he was a hierarchy child like me. Uh, he was, I brought out that he was in several of the different projects and experiments with me and another little boy who was my training partner. Um, so, you know, some of those projects were The Looking Glass and Star Wars Now. Um, so those are some of the things that I have brought out about him. And I encourage people to especially, you know, follow Timothy because he's been bringing out, um, you know, some of those things questioning, you know, what did Elon know um, about, about the system? And uh, I believe, you know, that... Um, well, maybe let me start back. Uh, we'll say that Timothy has posted that Elon, um, you know, is going to be called to testify. So um, we can still follow about that. And that was right before he started posting uh, the Twitter files. So I believe that that's part of the release of uh, the public releases of some of this evil that has been taking place. And I believe that, you know, some of uh, the children who have been abused by this brotherhood system, that they're getting to bring forward the truths about the system. And so believe I believe that Elon is participating in that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. As a, he's doing a, he's making a lot of really powerful moves right now for the people uh, yeah. during, during a time of great oppression in our country. Um. So I'll go through a, a couple other names. Uh, some some listeners may or may not have heard of these people. Uh, so one of them is is Ted Decker. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ted Decker. Okay, I'm not. Yeah. He's a he's a Christian author that um, he's written several books. He's like the Christian version of Stephen King. And okay. Some, some creepy books that um, usually have good <laughs> lessons in them, but he wrote one called "The Forgotten Way," which is uh, select verses of the teachings of Yeshua. And hmm. um, I just I find that one interesting. Is recommended to me by um, eh, I'll leave that out. It's recommended to me by somebody who um, I'm not so sure it has has pure good intentions. Um, hmm. So I was just curious if you were familiar with that. Another one nope. would be Paul, Paul Selig, who is a channeler who has um, referenced the order of Melchizedek. And he says that he can hear, uh, he can, he can listen uh, for people. So you can call, you can pay, you know, a few hundred bucks and call and have a 30 minute phone mm -hmm. call with this guy. And he can hear for you and talk to dead relatives and things like that. So will you talk um, a little bit I about that? 
I'm not, yeah, I'm not familiar with him personally, but I am very familiar with the concepts of channeling as well as uh, t speaking to the dead is a form of necromancy. So in that, you know, when I um, witness those things in my occultic experiences, um, you have an individual that really is connecting to um, a spirit, but it's not a human spirit. Scripture tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the afterlife. Um, so I believe that they're, you know, connecting with demonic spirits. When you think about it, these demonic spirits that were cast to the earth, um, they've been around since the beginning when they fell. And their job is to tempt us, to try to keep us from God. Uh, they have spent, you know, a lot of time researching, watching us, um, learning how to mimic us. So, you know, when I experience things like ghost apparitions as a child, you know, I recognize that it really wasn't a ghost, that it was just a demonic spirit. And, you know, because they had studied the people, they could very easily deceive and trick individuals who lost family members to believe that they were speaking to their family member because they knew things that that family member did. They knew distinct characteristics, uh, certain things they would say, and they can mimic those things. And what happens then is, you know, as you believe it's your loved one, um, there's an automatic emotional attachment that's formed to that spirit. And that's how that spirit gets access point or permission to begin, um, you know, having a relationship in that, and that relational uh, connection, you know, another word for that would be that they get their foot in the door and you better believe that they're going to take as much permission and access as they can get. Okay. So my belief gives them the permission to say, Hey, yes, I can do this, which then affects me on an emotional scale, which is opening the door for vulnerability within myself for them to be able to manipulate me based on the emotions that they sense coming from me. It, yeah, it really has, I wouldn't say the emotion really affects anything okay. in itself, but it's just that you open that door willingly. Um, it's almost like an open invitation in okay. because you're like, oh, you know, yes, I want to talk to my grandfather. Yes, I want to, I want to visit. I want to see him. And just that willingness to eat you know, look opens the door. The willingness mm -hmm. to connect or entertain that spirit opens the door. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, that spirit starts talking to the person. They're thinking it's grandpa giving them directions and they're going to, um, you know, open that door to listen and act upon that. And now that demon has that access point and is going to start demanding more. And it's going to do it in a very sly way. Um, you know, it's going to make you think that it's out of that previous relationship that you had with the real individual. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So that's what with, you know, the necromancy that can work that way, um, you know, where they're connecting to the spirits uh, that are going to tell them things about that individual's a uh, family member that they're wanting to know about. And, um, you know, those spirits will talk to whoever the necromancer or the psychic is who's trying to gain that information. Okay, right on. So this gentleman, Paul Selig, has um, written or it describes it as channeled several books. And this brings me to my next most exciting topic, which is frequency <laughs> and okay. sound. And uh, sound and frequency, obviously, you see the guitars behind me. I, I love it. Right. I love music. I've been deeply, deeply moved by music of all kinds. And so um, if you could just break down what you know about the effects of frequency, good and bad. I remember one of my questions specifically is about the sound uh, Jesus. Cause if the Bible, you know, is the true, word of god through time through translation then does the sound matter and to what degree does the sound matter saying jesus versus yeshua versus yahweh 
Yeah, um, you know, I grew up learning those things as breath sounds, and in the occultic system, they are very, very important. Um, you know, God has created his word. Scripture tells us that his word is living and active. So the enemy first gains control by controlling how we say certain words, um, you know, because he knows that those words have power. They have the power for death and destruction. Um, they also have the power for life. And the enemy doesn't want us to use words for life. Um, so therefore he, you know, manipulates that. Um, I so, am somebody that believes that the Lord knows when we call on his name. Um, I don't believe it matters you know, if you use Yeshua, if you use Yahweh, if you use Jehovah, if you use God, uh, when you call to him, he knows that you're calling to him. Um, at the same time, if you're calling on another spirit, you know, he knows that too, and he's not going to answer to that. Mm. So, um, but there is importance in those. And, you know, as we use those words, again, we either bring life or we bring death. Uh, the occultists are very skilled at using even the word of God. Um, one of my show hosts that I work with, uh, George, on the Reveal Report, we've done many shows on this where we talk about, you know, that occultic standpoint. Um, you know, both of us went through different types of training in this. You know, he wasn't necessarily connected to the system as I was, but he was connected to some of the branches where he learned high levels of occultism. And, um, you know, for different books that we had to read through, go through, uh, in order to summon certain spirits, um, you know, in that you have to go through this whole process first where, you know, you're getting ready to summon this massive demonic general. Um, you need protection as you do that because you're dealing with a spirit being that has far more power than your physical body has. So, you know, these witches or warlocks that are going to enter into summoning, they're going to go through a process to do that. They're going to go through ritual cleansing, and it's going to surprise a lot of people to hear this. But their ritual cleansing that they go through is literally reading through certain psalms, and uh, they will fast, uh, they will do uh, cleansing of their bodies, and they will, you know, purge themselves of all sins, meaning they're going to confess all their sins. The next thing they're going to do is they're going to pray, and they're going to... The per Sorry to interrupt, but the, the purpose yeah. of this cleansing is to get all the gunk out of their body so that their body as a capacitor can hold that level of energy that they're trying to call in. Is that right? Well, part of that, um, it is going to be to make that connection because the demons do, you know, if they're going to be hosting those demonic generals, then yes, those demons do command the bodies be clean. But the other reason they do it is for control. And, it, you know, they want to be able to not have that spirit have any legal ground over their body. So if there's what's considered unrighteousness in them, that spirit can have control over them. And very quickly, you know, they could find themselves in a possession situation that they can't get out of. Um, so... They will pray. They will ask God for protection. You know, I grew up with individuals like my proctor who, you know, would ask the Lord to protect her right before she committed massive sin. And, um, yeah, so very interesting. That but is interesting they and confusing. <laughs> it is, right? It seems kind of backwards. Um, but it's because they understand the power um, in the word of God. Uh, they've spent a lot of time stripping the churches of understanding that power so that, you know, we're not taught the power in the word of God. We're not taught to speak forth the word of God for protection or for to stand upon it um, to overcome our enemy. But 
they do have that. They know how to do that. Um, you know, even our prayers are very uh, surface level. You know, we're not taught to use the word of God as a major point in spiritual warfare. Um, some churches that are more advanced in spiritual warfare begin to get into that and, you know, may use that. Some, you know, I have known some intercessors who are very skilled at that. Um, but for the most part, it's been something that has been withheld a lot from the majority of the church. Wow. Uh, you mentioned breath sounds as uh, the, the name of God. Will you talk yes. a little bit more about that? Um, well, the word literally says that God spoke all things into creation, um, that the word proceeded forth from his mouth, and that included his name. Um, what you have with a breath sound is you have an inhale uh, that is, you know, represented. Actually, let's start with the exhale. You have the exhale, which is represented by this up node sound wave, um, and it's sevenfold. Uh, in replication of the seven spirits of God. And then you have an exhale, which is a down node that's also represented by that sevenfold Holy Spirit. So each breath sound literally represents the glory of God, both as sound and light and vibration and frequency. Um, so, you know, based on how you shift that breath sound, that's where it starts to distinguish um, what God has created, all based on, you know, when the word says we are made in his image, it's literally in every way um, down to our DNA, where even in our DNA, you see the twofold breath sounds, the up and down, um, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God and his word. Yeah, you're talking about the two strands spiraling across each other. Right. Um, so what what are the seven spirits of God? I've never heard that before. Um, you can find that in the book of Isaiah as well as the book of Revelations. It talks about uh, the Holy Spirit of God being represented as a sevenfold spirit, not separate spirits, but it's one Holy Spirit represented in seven different ways, I guess that's the best way to explain it. And it says, you know, um, Isaiah, I believe it's nine, six, that, um, you know, the spirit of God is a living spirit and um, he's a spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might and a fear of the Lord. So that's how the seven spirits of God is represented. Um, the Jewish or the Israel, um, the Israelites would represent that spirit of God as the menorah that they put into the holy place in the temple. And that's why the menorahs would have the seven candles. Those seven candles represented the sevenfold spirit of God. Wow. Okay. And just to clarify, this has nothing to do with the, the seven, um, what the New Age community would refer to as chakras. It's they have taken the concept of the Spirit of God and um, manipulated the understanding of it. So I would say absolutely it does have to do with that, but not in the sense that they teach it as the chakras um, we literally have that image of god within us and the chakras could also be called spiritual gates and we have those access points in our body where the holy spirit is meant to dwell it says you know that our bodies are a temple and that the spirit of the living god dwells within us um, but you know they teach that you can access that and you can control uh, your body, control what's happening through that, control your energy. And they leave out the spirit of God in that. And they invite other spirits in that they're connecting with. So Reiki, 
Reiki yeah. would be a good example of that where they say, oh, your your middle or whatever chakra is blocked. We need to get it rotating in the proper right. direction. And, and then they do some, um, I don't know what you would call it. Re- energy work is what they refer to it as. Right. Okay. Okay. And, it, you know, there are interconnections. Um, a lot of that energy work is based off of um, this, we'll say the spiritual science that King Solomon, uh, he was King David's son, was very aware of when when the Lord gave him wisdom, the Lord literally revealed to him his patterns for everything. And so, you know, that knowledge that the system has held on to is secret knowledge is the knowledge that God revealed to Solomon. But they tend to, as they regurgitate it, they tend to leave God out of that knowledge and they will then use it to connect with the demonic spirit in different types of witchcraft or different things so um you know i would say at the root of that 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 knowledge you know they've it was god's and they've manipulated that Mm -hmm. um and that also is uh kind of intersects a little bit with the sound they the new age community also does something called sound healing. And you have these different crystal, right. these quartz crystal bowls that have, a, they emanate a specific frequency to affect those certain regions of the physical right. body or, or chakras or spiritual gates. So what can you say about that versus, you know, if you go to a church and you're going to praise God and they do music at the beginning and, and the, the effect of one seems so much more um, well aimed rather than mm-hmm. the, the other one just seems kind of more broad and generic. So what can you say about yeah. using sounds to glorify God? Um. The Lord has created it where we can use sound for healing and things like that. But again, it has to be through the movement of his Holy Spirit. His word says that he sings over us. He dances over us. Um, That act of worshiping him is something that brings in the presence of his Holy Spirit to do the healing work. Um, You know, it's scientifically proven that our bodies, the different body parts that we have resonate at different frequency levels. Um, That's part of how, um, you know, alchemy, all of that that's used for the pharmacies and making medications, um, they literally, you know, have figured out and followed Solomon's written out science that shows that certain things vibrate at certain levels. Uh, That's how they figure out what medicines will affect or what herbs, what plants will affect certain parts of your body. Um, So, you know, I guess I I don't know where exactly to go with that. But, you know, an example would be that, you know, like for the mind, um, they know that there's a certain range, the um, the third octaves and stuff that affect this you know, your, your mind region. And they know, uh, based on the element charts, they know which elements operate within that, that octone, or sorry, octave. And, um, you know, then they can figure out from there, you know, it's like, okay, well, you're having trouble with your, you know, you're seeing hallucinations, basically, you're seeing into the spirit world, and you're not able to turn your spiritual eyes off. And what's one of the metals that controls or helps your body control your spiritual sight? Uh, that's lithium. So they will play with your lithium levels, give you more or, you know, give you less in order to turn off or turn on those spiritual eyes. Um, so there's different, you know, I would say that's a very, it's a very valid point. Um, that God created us to operate off of song. Uh, Much of his word, you know, was passed down generationally through song. And it was a very oral, you know, oral traditions. And people, you know, didn't um, 
necessarily read the word, they heard it, they memorized it, and they would repeat back. And what we have now is that, you know, some people don't even pronounce certain words in scripture correctly because we haven't been taught the correct pronunciations. We haven't example? been taught the full meanings of them. What was that? Do you have an example of a word in scripture that is broadly mispronounced? Well, I think of, you know, like in our English language, um, you know, we have five different words for love. And, you know, we just translate in our Bible in the New Testament, we translate several different words in the Hebrew or in the Hebrew and Greek into love. Um, But in the Greek, you have five different words. You've got eros, which has a very sexual connotation to it. You have um, phileo, which is the friendship or kind of the brotherly type of love. And then you have the agape love, which is unconditional. So where that affects some of the things is that, you know, it affects with the words that we hear, the power comes also as we understand the true meanings and concepts that were being communicated. So like in the New Testament, there's a passage where, you know, after the resurrection, Jesus is speaking to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. And again, he says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know, I love you. And a third time he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know, I love you. And we sit there and we think, well, why did Jesus ask him three times if he loved him? He was using a different word. They're using different words. And when you understand the words that were used, you understand the context. You know, Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? And Peter says, Lord, I phileo you. You're you're a dear friend. You're a brother to me. And he again says, do you agape me? Mm -hmm. And the release that comes out of that, you know, what's Jesus is after the third time he asks that question, what does he say to Peter? You know, he says, Peter, do you agape me? If you do love me unconditionally, then tend to my sheep, take care of my people. Mm -hmm. So what he was saying in that is that something more than just a brotherly love is needed to tend God's sheep. You know, Peter had to be willing to unconditionally love the Lord, even to the point of death, to be able to properly tend God's sheep. Um, You know, so it was a very high calling that he was giving him. Uh, The same thing with the word Lord. Um, You know, we just translate it as somebody who has, you know, control, power over us. Um, You know, that automatically gives many people kind of an anti-reaction to calling Jesus their Lord and Savior. Um, But I read there's a great book called uh, Master of My Heart. Um, that's from the early 1900s where he does, you know, a breakdown of those Greek words, what was really meant when Jesus is called Lord and the different times that word is used in scripture. And, you know, by the end of the book, you have an understanding that by Lord, it's meaning that that's the individual that you are allowing to have full sovereign control and authority over your life because that lord is going to you know govern properly he's going to provide he's going to protect he's going to build a hedge around you and be that safe place so there's that relationship of trust with this individual that you're calling lord it's not like an overlord who's you know going to be evil taskmaster so you, you know, it helps you understand better that concept of who Jesus is. So, you know, we lose a lot in the translations if we're not looking up the Hebrew and the Greek and the original meaning of those words in Scripture. Right on. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Um, do you... What is your understanding of... Um, like we mentioned earlier, the 
the clean, the cleaning of the body and having the body be cleansed and pure and fasting and such as um if the body is cleaner do you believe that it's has a higher capacity to interact or interface with god absolutely um there are different measures of stature and our stature is our right standing before god and the lord calls us and it has equipped us to be able to have the full measure of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his word says that if there's sin, if there's uncleanness, unrighteousness in us, if there's idol worship, um, that that affects our relationship and our position of standing before God. Now, in saying that, we really have to understand, like, why would we be standing before God? Um, you know, it's because God wants to have a type of relationship with us where we are ruling and reigning with him as sons and daughters. Um, he wants us to be in that intimate relationship. And when we're not in that righteous place, the enemy again, you know, he's going to have the dominion and the authority that God has given to us. So, um, you know, if we want to be ruling and reigning with him, we, there's no option, but we have to be in that place, not only where we're confessing and repenting, but we are coming before him saying, Lord, I want more. I want more righteousness. Um, you know, how do I increase that righteousness? How do I walk more in your ways? Hmm. So, if um if evil can gain a foothold by our own uncleanness or unrighteousness then things that i've heard uh heard you mention before about ways that the system will make money is that they they take um they take remains of of corpses and things and grind them up and then uh, somehow insert them into like mass food production systems. So mm -hmm. that, so if we're eating, you know, processed foods with garbage in it, um, those may or may not have that type of material in them to create an unclean physicality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The enemy uses that as a way to curse us and to curse our bodies and to affect our righteousness. Um, how to, overcome that is just pray you know there's really no way to avoid it because you know you can't tell where they've put it um you know they're so clever about how they do it it's pretty much in everything including you know they put it in um you know different things that are going into the soil it's put into the food that's given to animals so you know, it's put into your medications, the pharmacia uses it as fillers. So there's really no way to avoid it. But we have such an amazing God that, you know, if he could turn water into wine, he certainly can completely cleanse the food that we're eating. Um, you know, we even have issues where they're, you know, with chemtrails, you know, they're putting chemicals. Who knows what's in those chemicals? You know, I wouldn't put it past the enemy to have you know, ashes or remains in that as well, because they want us to be unclean. Mm -hmm. But if we're praying, you know, every day we're asking for that cleansing, you know, by faith, we believe that the Lord protects us, that he, you know, cleanses our food, that he makes it so that, you know, it doesn't, what we eat doesn't affect that righteous state. Mm. Awesome. Okay. Um, Let's see. I'm looking at my other questions here. Going back to trafficking, um, I'd like to go in a little bit to um, local factions for manipulation or control of a region and trafficking in that regard. 
Okay, so are you talking like when you say local factions, are you talking about what I call like the departments and how that operates? Yeah, um, like your local Catholic church or your local Freemason lodge, it's, things yeah. like that. And with that, you know, we will give the disclaimer that, you know, as I'm talking about it, I'm talking about what I experienced as a child, how things operated. Uh, we're not saying that every person involved in these departments or organizations is part of this evil. So I want to make that very clear. Um, but what I experienced was that, you know, if we go back to that triangle representing the system, at the very top, you had the five mothers of darkness. Underneath them, you had the satanic or druidic council. Uh, those were individuals that they're going to have um, jurisdiction and authority over quadrants. Uh, so that's going to be like north, south, east, west. That's going to be within the United States. That's also going to be internationally. So based on which quadrant they're put over, um, you know, they'll sit in seats and, and rule over those quadrants. Um, the next group of people underneath them are what we call grand high priest or priestesses. Those individuals also are going to be assigned to specific quadrants. Uh, they directly are under the councilmen, so the councilmen will give them orders, and their job is to you know, make sure that that quadrant is functioning and operating like it's supposed to. Um, the grand high priest or priestesses will then be in charge of high priest or priestesses who also are assigned by quadrant, but they're going to be more uh, controlling the regional levels. So, you know, they could be part of the eastern quadrant, but they're going to be assigned to a specific state or specific cities. Uh, that they're going to oversee within that quadrant. Um, then you're going to have, you know, those high priests and priestesses as they're overseeing that regional area managing it, uh, they're primarily going to be over five departments in the system. Those five departments are uh, the Jesuit Catholic, the Masons, the Mormons, the Kabbalah, and the Satanists. Um, you know, Satanists we're using as a broad term, um, you know, that could include the Druids in the area, the Covens, the Warlocks, the Witches. Um, so that can be a vast variety of different individuals. Um, so, you know, then those, those departments are over, going to oversee um, the system's assets, which are going to be the hierarchy children and the expendable children. For the hierarchy children, you know, their job is to um, train and program. So, you know, the children are going to be chosen at a young age. They're going to already know kind of the areas within the system that they want those children to operate through different testings and um, things that they do. And they're going to guide and direct the children within that realm of job possibilities within the system to ensure that the system continues to, to function. Um, you know, so you could have, you know, some of those kids who are hierarchy children are going to be chosen for very high positions in the system. Some are going to be chosen for very low positions. Um, it just depends on their spiritual gifts and um, how the system desires to use them and their training is is basically um, you know worked around what um, the system gleans will be their their use or their role in the system mm -hmm. um, with the expendable children that's a little bit different um, you know those five departments also manage the assets of the system so their job is to make money off of those children. Um, the first way that they're going to make money is, is through, you know, trafficking and sexual exploitation. Um, the next way that they're going to make money off of those kids is through ritual killing and cannibalism. Um, after they have, you know, made money off of that, 
uh, they're going to sell the remains for further money. Um, those how, remains. Question: How exactly would money be made off of ritual killing and cannibalism? Are they selling the them as like food to consume? Some, yes. Um, the elite members within the system will pay money uh, to ritually kill. Um, a child, and they'll pay money to consume those children. Why? Why? What? Like, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes. It, of... It's the evil and the wickedness. <laughs> um, so things that I grew up where, you know, when I experienced that, um, you know, every year there were massive hunting parties. So you know they would have expendable children in cages they would release them into the woods and those elite members who were the hunters uh would pay big amounts of money to go out and do to hunt these children down and kill them and then you know after they killed them they would consume um you know but some of that they would choose sometimes to do trophy killings uh which means that they may keep a certain part of the body uh, they may have that child's body incinerated and turned into a diamond, which they keep or they sell. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's not saying that's the only way it happens, but, um, you know, sometimes it's as exotic art uh, yeah. where there's, you know, parts of the bodies that, or, you know, like blood is mixed into the paint. Um, you know, they may have fingerprints that are kept on uh, that. They may have, you know, pieces of hair, um, different things that they they sell. They also uh, will harvest body parts, um, you know, and display those in uh, jars with formaldehyde, uh, different things like that, um, that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily understand that that was you know, a child they had hunted or, or ritually killed and that they've kept as a trophy. Um, so recently in the, um, the, the public, in the public, we've seen a lot of information increasingly about trafficking, um, human trafficking and, and mm -hmm. sexual slavery and things like that. Um, what is something that can actively be done if someone's listening to this? Like, what can any of us do about all of this wild information that is very not everyday information for most people? The greatest thing you can do is is pray and to gain awareness and knowledge of how things are working and be aware in your area. Um, as we, you know, when I say pray, I'm not meaning just the simple types of prayer where we're saying, Lord, pre please protect the children, please, um, you know, stop the trafficking in my area. Um, Isaiah 58 tells us that God desires us to fast so that our voices may be heard on high, so that the, the yokes of oppression and the chains of wickedness may be broken asunder and so you know i encourage people to do maps of your area um the biggest thing that hinders us from making an impact is that people are afraid they're afraid to engage they're afraid to know who their neighbors are and they tend to isolate or seclude themselves especially if they know that those neighbors are um, witches or warlocks or, you know, have witchcraft paraphernalia stores um, or even the Masons, you know, they're afraid to go to the lodge and get to know people. And I'm not encouraging people to buy a membership, but the, the issue is that, you know, many of these people, they know who the strong Christians in their area are. They know those that are, that are praying against them. Um, you know, and really you can't s stop the evil unless you really know those people. Um, you know, so I encourage people 
to walk your communities, put anointing oil on your shoes, anoint the land as you pray, um, pray the harder prayers, ask God to tear down the places of wickedness and to show us where they are. Um, ask the Lord to bring up, to let the earth spew forth the wickedness that's in it and to lay it bare and naked before all eyes. Um, ask the Lord to show you where that wickedness is happening. And then, you know, on top of that, we need to be establishing places unto the Lord. So, you know, really there's a lot of intercession that goes into that type of praying. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, I'm certainly not encouraging anybody to, you know, take physical action or to do things like that against our neighbors. You know, I believe that the way that we win people from, you know, out of that darkness and out of that wickedness is through building relationships. You know, when you're walking with the Lord, they know it. And, you know, if you go in preaching the gospel, giving them, you know, the word, uh, as we call it, Bible thumping, you're going to get a very cold, closed off response. Been there. You know, <laughs> they don't want that. They don't yeah. want your type of Jesus that you're going to thump them on the head with because they know they're sinners. And in fact, you know, as several occultists have, you know, proclaimed throughout my years, um, you know, we know we're going to hell. We don't need somebody to tell us we are. So what do they need? That's where you start. You know, when I go in to meet people, it could be like, you know, when I was working at the pharmacy, I recognized the Masons. I knew, you know, who was in my community. And when they came in, you know, I would ask him a simple question. Oh, like you're picking something up. So it seems like you're not feeling good, you know. And sometimes they would open up and start talking about it. They would yeah. talk about their health issues. Well, that right there gives you a, a place to start praying for them. And you don't have to even let them know you're praying, yeah. you know. Yeah. You can just take the prayer request. You begin praying. The next time you see them, Hey, how have, are you feeling better? You know, just through general caring oh, and compassion. loving these people, you're building those relationships. Or maybe, maybe one of them has had a loss. Maybe they've lost their wife recently or something. You know, you can offer, hey, it'd be nice to go out for lunch. You know, I'd love to get to know you more. Let's go out to lunch and have a talk. And you just open up that doorway to just relate and connect to them. And you know, that's what I see that as, as we just be real people, having real experiences with them, they see that there's something different in you and they're going to pick up on it. They're going to know. And, you know, the more that you attempt to build that relationship, they're going to want to know your God because they know their God well. You know, they know they're the cruel taskmaster that they're stuck under. So, and pray for the Lord to open those opportunities for you to begin to witness to them. Um, you know, share your experiences, share about your miracles, share about the things that are important to you that God's doing in your life. Um, you know, make it palatable <laughs> yeah. in a way, because so many times we we're afraid to share our experiences. We're afraid to just, talk about things with people and you know as we enter respectfully you know even with anointing we don't have to go and you know i do not encourage people to go into other people's shops or their homes and destroy their things you know oil can destroy stuff but if you you know you're putting it on your shoes you're just graciously walking around praying as you go um you know, really, there's nothing wrong with that. But be mindful not to, you know, destroy their livelihoods because that, in a way, destroys your witness to them. Mm -hmm. Compassion. Love your yeah. enemy. And pray. Um, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah. 
something that's been nagging at me is uh, that I haven't heard yet. I don't know if you've told this part of your story. I'm, I'm sure you have. You have a lot of data in a lot of places that I haven't yet heard. But when you, okay, so you're a child, you were part of this bloodline. And so you were kind of inducted into this thing without choice. Mm -hmm. And then you now looking at you now, you are out of it. You are sharing your testimony about it. So to fill in some of the gaps, like how did you extract, like physically, how did you extract from all of this? Where were you? Where did you go? And how did you do it? Yeah, that literally was the miracle of God. Um, You know, it, it really is difficult for the majority of people to get out of the system because once you're born in the way the enemy sees it, you belong to him and he owns you and you know, you're part of his kingdom and he's going to keep account of everything he owns. Um, When people try to get out, you know, usually there's only three ways to get out. Uh, You're going to be murdered. uh, You're going to run and be in hiding your entire life and they're going to proceed to hunt you down until, you know, they kill you or you commit suicide. So those are really the only three ways out. Um, but what happened in my situation was at age 10, I was at a family funeral. And as I turned from the casket and was walking to the car, the Lord just very clearly said to me, I have released you from them. And the moment that happened, there was a shift. Um, They literally lost their power and their authority over me. And from that moment on, the Lord delivered me out with a mighty hand, um, which meant that I was not, you know, having to be subjected to them having that control and that authority. Now, it didn't mean that the enemy gave up on me, you know, For the rest of my life, he continued to remind me that I had a position and I needed to take it. But in that, he could not force me to take that or to do anything in regards to his kingdom. Um, You know, he attempted to get me to go back by, um, like when I first got out at age 10, we lived near a witch's coven. And at night, the witches would gather and they would um, chant all night long so that I would hear them. They would astro project in my room and try to choke me and scare me. Um, You know, they would do different things like that in order to try to pull me back in. And, you know, I had to learn spiritual warfare there where, you know, I had to learn to speak out the word of God and to say, you know, no, like I rebuke you in Jesus name. And so that was part of that. And I would say, you know, even though I had some of those experiences with um, the warfare after I got out, really I was protected very strongly from the enemy. And the Lord enabled me um, to continue to, you know, I went to church every week. Um, I began to really study uh, different missionary books where the Lord was teaching me spiritual warfare. Uh, One of the biggest individuals was Corey Ten Boom. And then, um, you know, even I went back for family events uh, because, you know, my parents didn't know what was really going on. So I had to still show up for, you know, family socials and other things every, you know, multiple times a year and interact with these people. And um, these, these people being like your grandmother, who was also your proctor and largest abuser. Correct. Yes. My proctor and, um, you know, other family members and we'd have huge family gatherings. And so so do your parents know now about all that stuff? They did. Actually, um, my mother found out around age 10. It was towards the end of that time when I had already gotten out. And she had come through the hallway one day and heard me and my brother talking about it and talking about some of the places where things had happened. And she had experienced stuff too as a small child in the occult. But what had happened was that her family had told her that she was crazy and would tell her that she just had horrific nightmares. 
Um, so she didn't know that it was real or that the places that she was dreaming about were real until she heard us describing one of the places. And she literally like had walked past the room and walked right back and was like, what did you just say? And she's like, was I talking in my sleep? And I was like, no, mom, that's a real place. And she's like, it's real. She's like, have you been there? And I was like, yeah, I can tell you right where it is. And I told her where it was. And she, that was the first time she realized it was real. And she immediately, you know, tried to contact police in a different um, area from where we were at to report it. And she tried several different calls to different areas. And those officers literally told her, you know, lady, if you and your children want to live, keep your mouth shut and never talk of this again. What? So How they wouldn't people? even take her report. How many people said that? Three different jurisdictions. And this is like the first line of contact. You call someone, picks up, you tell them this stuff, and then they say that? That is what they told her, yes. Whoa. That's interesting. That doesn't, doesn't give yeah. me a lot of faith in, uh, in local law enforcement on a spiritual level. Um, right. And this was back in the, you know, the eighties. So, Oh, okay. Big difference. Uh, 87. So, so, so what about your dad? How did your dad respond to all this? I mean, I'm a dad. My dad so was a- not aware. Yeah. Um, with both my parents, um, you know, because things were hidden, we, we had the things that we did in the occult, but then we had our cover life. So, you know, every day it was made to look like I went to school, came home. My parents came home from work. We would eat dinner. People would go to bed and it seemed like a normal life to them. But, you know, what was really happening was that it would be made to look like I went to school. I really would go to a training center or to the military bases uh, for training And I'd be marked present as though I was there at school. Um, You know, we were home for when my parents got home. And then, um, you know, they would put, I'll say my proctor or whoever was supplying the food uh, for meals would put drugs into it. And so my parents would, and siblings would eat. They would fall asleep early. Um, They would think they were going to bed around eight or nine, but really they were out around, you know, six or so and then i would continue with my nighttime training um which usually was in our home or at certain ritual places and um you know that would go until three in the morning so my dad really had no clue any of this was going on at all um you know so this is your grand your grandmother was your proctor correct correct and she's the one that basically says, oh, don't worry, mom and dad, I'll take her to school. I'll pick her up from school. And really, she's carting you around to these other places. That's what's happening? Correct. Okay. So then as far as uh, when you hit age 10 and your mom started to realize like, oh, this is real and this is happening to my daughter, did your dad become aware of it at that time or any time after that? There were times, um, I believe that the first time she attempted to tell him was when I was about in fifth grade. So I think I was about 12 then um, and uh, maybe 11. And I can remember she tried to tell him and he just, you know, told her she was crazy, didn't want to hear it. And I think it was, you know, at the time, I think it was just because he, he had no awareness, no context for that. He really was not a Christian used to the types of terminology. And it was so far left field that he just didn't even have a base of understanding to receive that. Mm -hmm. And his experience of, you know, her side of the family was that they were just good old fashioned peeps. You know, they went to Catholic church, they went out hunting a lot and he would go hunting with them, you know, just regular hunting Um, you know, he didn't know what went on behind the scenes, you know, he would go out fishing, um, you know, so he, he didn't know what was really going on behind the scenes, everything to him, what he saw was that cover life that functioned perfectly, you know? So for him, there was not even any reason to question something was off or outside of that because, you know, that 
we call it in the system posture. You're trained to have that perfect cover life posture. You know, nothing looks wrong. People could not, you know, see you and spot you and be like, there's something wrong with her. She must be part of the occult. You're meant to, in that cover life, have that perfect, you know, that form of godliness, that perfectionism. Uh, and, you know, so that people don't even question or answer. It, there's nothing in your life that makes people, you know, look and even wonder if you're part of that occult or that brotherhood. Has he ever come around to this information? Yes, my father is aware today, and both my parents have been, you know, very strong supporters as I've gone forward. Um, you know, we've been able to talk about some of it, um, you know, very encouraging, saying, you know, you need to do what you have to do, and we're right here. So, um, Right on. That's great. Yeah. And, and um, has this... Um, this information coming out with your parents becoming aware of it brought you guys kind of closer together, like more of a, a stronger family bond. Yeah, I am very close with both of them right now and awesome. many people within my family. So right on. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, so uh, what are some of the, some of the like residual effects that you're experiencing from that time? You said that, that there are still people or entities reaching out saying, Hey, this position's available to you still. What, <laughs> what other kinds of things are there? Yeah, that that's a nice say? way to put it. <laughs> oh, so, will you give some examples of like what, how that looks in your own life? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I get the, you know, usually the invitations come in the form of letters. Um, there'll be poetry to remind you. Um, I've had where they literally send people into my jobs to deliver messages to me. Um, they hijack my email uh, and I'll get emails from the World Governing Council, you know, reminding me of certain things, um, you know, when they're unhappy with the direction I'm going. Uh, they'll send me messages, you know, like keep tightening those screws tighter, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that, which it's really not a nice thing. It's really, a, it's a you know, a, a threat. So, um, you know, they, yeah, there's a lot of monitoring, tracking, um, a lot of intimidation, things like that. As I've gone forward, um, you know, especially with, and it's interesting because, you know, part of that, we talked about the light and the dark side of the system. Part of that end time agenda that I was trained for, uh, which lines up with the biblical agenda that, you know, the Lord has said that, the Antichrist is going to come, the false Christ are going to rise. And, you know, that will be before Jesus comes back and returns and his kingdom comes in the fullness of its power. Um, so, you know, part of that agenda of the system or the new world order is to raise up that Antichrist and to create the system of the beast. Um, so within that, you know, there were things that end time events that I was prepared to um, do certain things at, release certain prophecies, um, you know, and we're talking like prophecies within the system, not biblical prophecies. Um, you know, none of that actually happened so far. Um, the rituals that I was supposed to perform for some of those end time things, I did not show up for. Um, you know, it didn't mean that the Antichrist didn't get to step into his position or isn't going to rise. But what it meant was that as to the fullness of their plan, it, things have not worked out like they anticipated and prepared for. Mm -hmm. So they've had to make adjustments along the way. Um, you know, a big adjustment for them has been me coming forward with my testimony, especially in the courts. Um, you know, that was not in their playbook, but they've had to adjust and, you know, do th certain things a different way because of that. Um, so there is this constant war with the system, and uh, that's probably the best way to describe it. Um, 
I guess that's the best way to explain it is that yeah. um, those how, are some of the things that have happened. <laughs> man, how, how frequently do these types of things occur in your life? Is this a daily thing, a weekly thing? No, uh, they're very seasonally timed. Um, so within that system, um, your official, like by the time you are age 10, you're fully trained for those higher level positions. So that means that if something were to happen to the person uh, whose position you're stepping into, you would be able at age 10 to step into that position mm. and operate. Um, so, you know, if nothing happens to that person, you kind of enter into what's considered a time of journeyman. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like a fellowship where you're going to be learning more, you're going to be going to college, you're going to be studying you're going to be learning skills and techniques that are going to aid you further or advance your skills in that position that when you get ready to step into it, um, you'll have. Uh, usually those positions you step into somewhere between age 30 to 45. Mm -hmm. So at both those ages, um, I received official, you know, invitations in the form of letters and you know it was a take your position uh, when that happens um, there's a spiritual aspect to it as well as a physical aspect um, you know you're basically summoned to appear at a certain place and to go through a ceremony to take that position so that did not happen in my case um, I literally burned those letters and uh you know, did not show up. Now, curiously enough, in the amazing power of God, um, you know, I kept getting hounded by the system to take that position. And in 2018, it, uh, 16 to 18, you know, I began to cry out, Lord, um, you know, what do I need to do to stop these people? You know, I've rebuked I've rejected, I have outright put my foot down and said no. Lord, what do I need to do to take that final stance against the enemy where, you know, he understands that I am not taking that position the way that he intends me to take it. And I was surprised by the Lord's answer because the Lord said to me, take the position. And as I sat there with my mouth gaping, the Lord said, until all things are subjected under my feet. And I understood by that, that what the Lord intended was that I, you know, verbally receive that position and I proceed to lay everything in that system that then, you know, the power, the authority, the control, uh, the jurisdiction that came with that position, I gave back and placed under the Lord's control and his headship. So in 2018, I did that in prayer with several prayer warriors, and we laid everything down. And at that time, as I laid it down, I literally, do, you know, went into the heavenly courts and I served a divorce to Satan. And I said, I am divorcing myself from you. And in fact, I'm divorcing everybody in the system from you. No longer do you have control. We do not want you. We do not want to be in a relationship with you. And we are divorcing ourselves. And so that was part of the beginning of the work that God is doing now was that that had to happen. That divorce had to take place um, within that system. And the headship had to be given back to Jesus Christ. And as I did that, now the Lord, you know, is moving powerfully. He's put me into a position where, um, you know, I'm beginning to raise people up, equip them in the Lord um, through my website, Kingdom Living with Jesse.com, and teaching people how to really live for Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this new life in Christ. How do we live that? And so, you know, none of that could have happened if I was still bound under that old system that was run by lucifer so it was it was kind of like a like a transfer of power you accept this this 
was correct in and order, in order submitted to it, it over to God. Correct. Surrender is a really good word for that. There was a surrendering that had to take place to break that power and that authority that w was held by the enemy. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, is your uh, proctor still around? Yes, she is still alive. Still uh, part of that stuff? Yes, I believe so. Hmm. Wow. Um, can you g give, how are you on time? What What's your time? I'm good. On? Yeah, I'm good on time. Cool. Um, how, can you give a few examples of some things, some instances that have happened of of you or people you know being in prayer about specific things and then seeing the immediate results of those things? Or maybe not immediate, but shortly thereafter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things the Lord has had us doing is taking back control of the waterways and the well springs. Um, I grew up, you know, spending a lot of time reading scripture, um, especially after I got out, uh, you know, I was in the word all the time and really, you know, through um, the Baptist church and the uh, program Awanas, I really fell in love with the word of God. So <laughs> I memorized that. all the scripture I could. I wanted every bit um, in my arsenal to use against the enemy. So um so as I did that, though, um, you know, some of my favorite verses were ones about the well springs that are talked about in the book of Isaiah, you know, where it says, you know, in those days, I will uh, ride out in the desert places and, um, you know, I will cause the well springs to well up. And, you know, it talks about that those well springs are connected to salvation, so I always just saw it as something spiritual that when the Lord spoke of the wellsprings, that it meant that salvation was going to break out in an area, and I would pray for that. Um, but recently, the Lord's been showing us that he's literally taking back the physical waterways. Um, and, you know, we were praying over some specific areas that had wellsprings, and we took, you know, the authority over those wellsprings. And as we did, um, like one of the places there was not a well, um, like we saw the wellspring in the spirit world, I'll say, mm -hmm. and in vision. And as we prayed, all the, you know, we were contacted a couple of weeks later and told by the pastors there that this land that has not had a living active well on it, all of a sudden, has water shooting up out of the ground and they now have to build a well. Um, so that's a huge miracle. Uh, one of the other places was actually, you can look up uh, Noka County, Minnesota, and I believe it was either September, or October, right around, I think it was the end of September uh, going into October there, but literally it rained mud. And we were praying for the well springs in that area one night. And the Lord said to me, you know, like I saw in the vision, I saw this mountain that was kind of standing as an obstacle in that area. And I, the Lord said to me, how do you want to move this mountain? And I said, well, Lord, you've, you said in your word, you've given us authority and you've given us a threshing sledge. And I said, I just want to sweep that sledge under that mountain and haul up all the mud and bring all that wickedness and everything that's been hidden underneath it up in that area. And, uh, you know, I want to see everything level out and see that land become fertile ground instead of all that wickedness coming forward. And so it was reported back that it began to rain mud. <laughs> and so you can look that up. The news reported it. Uh, that was the day we were praying for Wellsprings. Wow. Um, we've also had amazing, you know, there's been amazing miracles in my life. Um, um, before you move on from the Wellsprings, uh, I have a little story I'd like to share with you. And, and maybe you have some insight about it. I don't know. Uh, do you know what a didgeridoo is? I have heard of that. Didgeridoo. Okay, so it's the um, it's uh, the the first human wind instrument, um, and it comes from the Aborigine culture in Australia, 
and it's basically a long hollow tube and traditionally it was um it was a tree that had been hollowed out by termites and they would go around and they would knock on these trees and and figure out which tree they want to cut so they would cut the tree and then cut it to a certain length so that when they buzz their lips into it it makes like a wall sound okay until they achieve a certain tone and so some somebody inspired me one time to play the didgeridoo i got a hold of one through an interesting series of events and and i took it to this place in nature that is that is beautiful this is one of my favorite places in in the southwest and uh, i took my didgeridoo into this so if you imagine a canyon and there's a creek running through the canyon and it's mm-hmm. like s- several hundred feet deep and you're traveling upstream and then you look to the right, you can see a side canyon that splits off and it's much more narrow. There's no water running through it, mm-hmm. but you have to cross through the water and then go back a little ways around a bend and it dead ends in like this in like this cul-de-sac shape and so it's like a cul-de-sac with walls that go up hundreds of feet and it's a a seasonal waterfall and that day that the day i'm talking about it was trickling sometimes people will rappel down this waterfall Mm -hmm. from way up ahead and so long story short after playing my didgeridoo in that space, the water began to gush. The trick, the trickle, the trickle had become a, a, whoops, a gush, and and it was like just completely mind-boggling to me. But I saw in my vision that water was moving upward, mm-hmm. and then it was gushing down. So I don't know if that's that originates from a spring, but hmm. uh, since then. I have yeah, that. somehow it affected it when you played that the didgeridoo. Yeah. So, yeah. Since then, I've had a vision of traveling through waterways to play the didgeridoo to achieve that purpose mm, again. Interesting. So you're you're praying for these waterways in order to make the waters of the earth come up and flow uh, properly or in a new way or 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 something. Well, it's taking the authority back um, because what's happened is that. You know, Satan and his principalities, particularly Leviathan, uh, scripture tells us that Leviathan frolics in the surface of the deep and in the waters. Um, so he has taken the, the authority over those waterways. And what happens is that, you know, the, um, the enemy uses those poisons, that water, and uses it to affect us. Um, what also happens is that it stops up the flow of the Holy Spirit because scripture also tells us that the Spirit of God moves through the surface of the deep. So it allows the enemy to operate in a way where he's building up those strongholds of wickedness in an area. And and so, you know, the Lord's been showing us that his desire, you know, is that salvation is going to break forth. But in order for that salvation to break forth, you have to remove the wickedness and the unrighteousness from the land, because his word says the righteous inherit the land. So if we want his works to go forward, if we want to have the good works that God's prepared in advance for us, we have to you know, take back that authority that God has given us to rule and reign with him here on this earth. Um, as we, pro- his word says that as we proclaim things in this, you know, whatever we bind in heaven is going to be bound on earth. Whatever we loose in heaven is going to be loosed on earth. So there has to be, a, you know, binding and loosing works two ways. Um, you have to, you know, bind up the enemy, bind the strong man, and then you have to bind the word of God um, and the name of the Lord to that land. At the same time, you have to loose that enemy, cast him out of that area, and you have to loose the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not saying that in that loosing that we have authority over the Holy Spirit, but the the Holy Spirit works in conjunction that, you know, part of that authority that he's given us is to speak forward his commands, the things that he's already ordained and decreed in his word. So as we speak that forth, um, 
we watch it happen. You know, the Lord performs his word and fulfills it. So there's a working together there between the Spirit of God and the sons of, of the living God um, that is the releasing of his works here on earth. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I think maybe more questions will come to mind, but I do have one more. Uh, and it's about uh, stuff you've mentioned in other other podcasts or, or whatever about uh, tunnels, tunnel systems, interconnected mm-hmm. tunnel systems for the purpose of human trafficking. And uh, the gist that I get is that these tunnels have been around for a long time. Um, yeah, generations. Um, if you go back in history, you know, really, I believe the majority of those systems were built um, in the 14th through the 16th centuries where you had the Knight Templars going out um, to conquer the land in the name of their kings. Um, you know, the reason that we know that the Knight Templars were also building these temples is because, um, you know, the above ground cities were designed in such a way that they, you know, to the Masonic and the Solomonic specifications uh, for ritual that it tells you what's below ground. Would this, so, be like, would this be like the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio that cathedrals are built in specification to? Correct. But okay. yeah, but it's more, there's more to it than just that. Mm. Um you know, so they specifically designed things so that, you know, as you, if you're part of that upper level brotherhood, as you enter into a city, you're going to know just by what you see above ground, uh, where you go, you know, to whose brotherhood that you can purchase stuff from, you're going to know where to go to eat, where to go for lodging, um, you're going to know where, you know, who, which societies in your area are the major ones that are hosting and have control, um, you know, so all that's laid out for them. Um, and so, you know, they are designed in a very specific way. Uh, the majority, everything is laid out in 15 mile radius segments within that 15 mile radius. You're going to have, um, indicators or markers that, that tell you where the underground is and where the entrances and the exits are. Um, the first thing that you always look for are you'll see three churches. Um, those churches will kind of be in a triangular positioning with one another. Um, and again, they'll be within a 15 mile radius of each other. Uh, so somewhere within that radius, um, why they would build those three churches together like that is because they would underground that's where they would in that middle area between those churches that they shared that's where they would build the shared uh, catacombs and those often became you know one of the main ritual areas underground Uh, they also would do a shared altar for sacrificing um, and then their tunnel systems would branch out from there So around those churches, then, that's where you're going to see your support buildings, your hospitals, your schools, your fire departments, um, your sheriff offices, uh, your governmental buildings. Um, And it's going to vary based on each state and each area. But those then, you know, the basements of those areas would often be the entrances or exits in and out of those tunnels. Um, You'd also have the graveyard. Uh, could be used um, wherever that was centralized. And based on where the graveyard was centralized would tell you um, where, you know, the main northern wall was. And that northern wall, once you knew where the northern wall was, the western wall is where they would place the altar. So just from the above ground things, you would know how to get in and out of that underground and how to... Um, access that altar during specific ritual times if you were summoned into that area or rituals 
So if you're not summoned into that area for rituals and you somehow can figure out how to get into these catacombs, can anybody just go into these places? Or is it like Lord of the Rings where you need <laughs> the special elvish passcode to open the, the stone door? Right. Usually they're heavily guarded. Um, by, by human beings? By humans, by entities, by, you know, based on the area and how heavily it's used, uh, they will, they will vary that access to it. Um, you know, one of the areas when I was a child, uh, they had a cul-de-sac um, in the graveyard that, you know, we would enter into in the middle of the night that would then go into the sewer tunnels and then we would use the sewer tunnels to get into the ch underground of the church. Wow. Um, now they have blocked off those, that cul-de-sac and they've put like a, like a water house over it and they have the doorway locked. So only those who have access through the key uh, can get in and out of that area. Um, so it varies. Some of their entrances are underground, like where, um, you know, at some of the bigger areas, uh, the military bases that are underwater, um, you know, underwater, you have a whole nother um, section of land. And so some of the major dumb bases are built under the floor of water surfaces and under the ocean. And so with those, you have to access through, you know, submarines or other, uh, or through the spiritual gates to get into those. Um, with that, you know, you can't get into a spiritual gate unless you know the song to open the door. So there's different things depending on the area and, you know, again, how heavily it's used. Um, on average with the tunnel system, you know, most areas, it's kind of like a three-layered system where you have the first layer of tunnels that is going to be, your, you know, used a lot by the utility companies. So that's going to be your water, your sewer. Um, you can have access points in and out of areas through that, but that's mostly going to be used by the, you know, utilities and stuff like that. Your second layer that then is underneath that is going to be used primarily by the military. Um, and then you'll have a third layer that's, you know, even deeper. And that area, you know, from my experience was used by what we call protectors in the system. These were individuals that, you know, from a very young age, they were chosen uh, to guard and protect certain elite members uh, so they have to know those deeper tunnel systems in case they need to get people to safety. Um, you know, they can hide them, they can transfer them through certain areas. Those areas are unmapped. Um, you know, if they're chosen for, you know, a position, they have to memorize those tunnel systems in the dark. Uh, there'll be areas where, you know, low oxygen, not a lot of light, um, so th that was kind of how I understood the tunnel systems to work. Um, within that, you know, most of, you know, the, the children in the, are going to be connected and trafficked through that middle layer um, that the military uses. And have you been in any of these tunnels? Yes, I have. And this was in so Chicago? Where you were, where you brought several up. different areas, uh, mostly in the Midwestern areas, um, and then some international. Uh, when we were in some different places for um, certain rituals, uh, particularly in Germany. Can you give an example of an international tunnel? I was saying, uh, like I was in one that was under uh, one of the main castles that we went to. In Germany, uh, uh, to Nurse, I call it Nurse von Stein, but uh, New Schwanstein. Um, that one has tunnels and underground areas that I was in. Okay, and these tunnels mostly, I mean, it, it probably varies based on the size and the depth, but these are generations old. So, how Correct. were they? How were these built, and who built them? Well, the specifications for the majority of them 
are much more advanced than what we are aware of at the surface level. Um, the, a lot of the deeper system technology that the system uses has not been made public at the surface level. So, you know, there's technology that uh, Tesla and other people even before him had harnessed. Um, some of it, I believe, even stems back to Egypt and Israel. We know scripture tells us, you know, in the book of Genesis that Israel was held in bondage in Egypt and um, that they were tasked to build the pyramids. Uh, those pyramids, I believe, were originally the storehouses that, jo that the Lord gave Joseph the concept for to store grain into. Um, so some of this technology is older, you know, whether the Lord gave it, whether the spirits gave it. Um, some of the things that I have witnessed, you know, not all deep layer systems, but, um, you know, the majority that we used um there is natural light deep under the earth and you don't have to have lights you don't have to have candles there's just light there um you know some of it operates off of static electricity where you know you go into certain areas you have to um gear up a certain way because the static electricity is so strong um you know so I guess that's the best way I can explain it. Um, you know, we know that there's advanced train systems, uh, there's advanced uh, vehicles. Um, you know, I, I have seen UFOs. I believe those are real, but I do not believe that they were created by aliens. Um, you know, my experience of them is that, you know, the book of Ezekiel in scripture talks about the angels riding on, um, these whirling wheels, uh, wheels within a wheel. And uh, that's some of the technology that um, our, our military and other militaries have, have taken and have been shown specifications of. They have created some of that. Um, you know, the spiritual gates, um, those are something that, you know, they operate off of mass amounts of energy that is natural. God made them to have that energy, um, which is based off of light and song. Um, you know, his word says in the book of Psalms, you know, enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart, enter his courts with praise. So how do you enter into those spiritual gates and get into the courts of heaven? You have to enter through praise and song. So everything is within his word on these things, but it's just been hidden from us. Wow. Wow. Um. <laughs> I know it's crazy when you really think you're like, oh my gosh, it's right there in front of my yeah, eyes. It's amazing. I just never knew. <laughs> um, oh, I had one. I had something I wanted to touch on. How big are these tunnels? Or are there giant tunnels or they it, all small? it varies. There are giant ones, yes. So um, to, to clarify, sorry, sorry to interrupt there. The, to clarify the the thing that you were mentioning just now about different technologies. So there are technologies that currently exist that are not on not in the public eye in any capacity, including like DARPA and stuff so this is just hidden things that are fully functional correct um you know there are entire cities underground um some of what we see that you know the green new deals like the big uh i forget exactly what they're called but the big uh fans that are circulating um windmills yeah 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 those are usually placed above areas where there are massive underground cities. Oh, so um, are there people they're used in these to cities? Give further energy to that area. Really, there's no benefit to the above ground. They're not harnessing that energy for us. They're harnessing it for their underground cities. Are there people in these cities, human beings? There are. 
Yeah, so some of the underground breeder programs are under there. How, uh, how deep are these things? Very deep. Have you? I I place? believe I have. Yeah, what? I've done some shows on them. Uh, the biggest shows that I have done, you could search the term Emerald City and mm -hmm. uh, Valhalla. Um, I've revealed the location of both those cities on previous shows, um, on my former shows, right on radio. Um, and so like uh, Emerald city is under the Pentagon and, um, you know, I, I encourage people read books like Jewel Varnes. Um, we've learned that these books are just, you know, fiction made up tales, but really they are real places, real locations, and they're just hidden from us. Um, so, you know, under there, under Emerald City, it's, it's really interesting. Um, there is a massive, the city is on one side of the underground down there. And then they have an area where there's a massive canyon that separates uh, the area where the city is from the dark side. And beyond in that dark side, and this is going to, you know, we're getting into conspiracy theories here. I but, think uh, past that. There are giants that are down there as well uh, that live in some of those areas. And in that area near Emerald City, the giants have to stay. Um, there's treaties and other things that are um, in place so that those giants remain on their part. Um, areas like Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, there are underground areas where giants live down there as well and have remained for centuries. Um, if you search it, it might be mostly off the internet, uh, but there was interesting exposure just this past September in Colorado Springs, and some of the giants escaped from underground, so it said and uh, they had to uh, close down some of the big park areas there to to get them under control and to get them back underground. What do so that giant... story briefly broke uh, that there was, and the way that it broke was that there was like lab, like a breach in the military lab, but that that area was mapped off in, you know, nobody could go in that area for a while until the all clear was given. So, yeah, Typical. some interesting things. <laughs> so how big are these giants and what do they eat? From my experience, they mostly eat people. They are big. Um, some of the ones that I have seen... Uh, we're probably close to, you know, 10 foot or taller. Um, wow. What do you say to that? Oh, man. I know. It's like. <laughs> no, I've got. Oh, man. That's, that's wild. Cause <laughs> we'll get into the, the wild time. parts of my story. <laughs> that's cool. That's great. Because th this isn't the first time I've heard this kind of stuff as far as giants and the, the mounds in Ohio and things like that, you know? Yeah, that's so, a lot of the mounds are built. You know, we're told they're Indian mounds, but there's a lot more activity that happens around those mounds. Right. Are you familiar with sites like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey and... Um, monolith, other monolithic structures like Stonehenge. With Stonehenge, yes, I haven't uh, heard of that specific place in Turkey, so that was not yeah. an area that had to be my specialty. So, right on, right on. Um, <laughs> and and what do you what do you know about Stonehenge? Um, well, I I believe in it's taught in the occult that that area was built up by giants, that it was ritual ground. Um, I do believe that there's an underground city there and that connects through ley lines to um, the headstone that's here in the United States. That's the smaller version, which is the Georgia Guidestones. I am familiar with that. And the Georgia Guidestones was built rather recently, right? Within the last 30 years or so? Yeah, yeah. And somebody uh, actually... Uh, put a bomb on it and like within the last couple of years did you did you hear about that yes it, it i think it was just this last year that actually 
there were some people out anointing that land and we don't know what exactly happened when i saw the video of it it looked like literally like a strike of light came sideways and hit it um but it was interesting that some individuals were anointing that land just a few days before that happened they were praying over that oh, area wow so yeah there's so a, there's a video i didn't even know that that's a yeah there were videos i think it I think we talked about it on one of my shows with uh, David Zublick on the dark okay. and he showed that video and uh, we were analyzing it. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. So <laughs> going uh, back to the pyramids, the pyramids have fascinated me. I've watched some documentaries on them and, and stuff. And there's um, one concept that I really, really appreciate is that the pyramid, the purpose of the pyramids is that they're like uh, generating stations so if you have, um, originally there was a different layer of stone on the outside, which I believe was limestone or, or something, but there's two layers of stone. There's one, and then it's the outside one, which can take the, the energy of the sun and it moves, uh, through, uh, what do you call it? When water runs underground, um, of the aquifer, an aquifer. Yes. So, so it excites the sun, the sunlight excites the aquifer somehow. Oh no, reverse that. So the sun shines on a lake and the lake is connected to an aquifer, which then runs into the bottom of the pyramid, which then charges the, the plates that are on the outsides of a certain type of stone. Um, so that's fascinating. But what you mentioned earlier is that you believe that they were used as storehouses for grain. Is that right? Yes. And, and um, why do you, what makes you believe that? Well, because the Bible tells us about it. Okay. Um, in the book of Genesis, it talks about, you know, there were um, one of the 12 sons of Jacob was taken captivity. Basically, his brother sold him into the land of Egypt. Um, you know, he was there many years under bondage. And then through a series of events, um, some of Pharaoh's workers end up in prison where they meet Joseph. And, um, you know, he interprets their dreams. So then a couple of years after that, uh, Pharaoh has a dream and no, nobody, none of his advisors can interpret it. And one of the guy who got out of jail, who worked for Pharaoh, uh, remembered Joseph and they brought Joseph in and the Lord gave him the interpretation of the dream. And basically it was that, you know, the Lord was going to be sending seven good years and then following that, there would be seven years of famine that, you know, were going to be so devastating. And, you know, out of that, the Lord gave Joseph wisdom and he encouraged Pharaoh, you know, store up during the seven good years. And then you'll have grain to hand out during those years of famine. So Pharaoh literally commissioned him as second in control of his kingdom told him to build those storehouses. So those, I believe, were the first pyramids that were built. And, you know, what happens, all Israel, all the nations around Egypt came to Egypt for grain. And they, they handed out, all the nations were saved in that area because of the wisdom that God gave Joseph. And then we see Israel, you know, that's how Israel comes into Egypt. But then later they end up under a different pharaoh who no longer remembers Joseph or thinks about him. And he holds those people captive in bondage. And it says that he had them. That was one of their tasks was to continue building the pyramids. Um, so they built those. And, uh, you know, there's some interesting things and theories around that, how they built that, uh, where, you know, even to the point where they knew how to, sing and use static electricity to move massive stones and rocks that they built and it tells us that the material that they used uh was water and water clay and straw so um the, to make the sound it go ahead okay the sound um the, the singing and the sound concept I, I subscribe to based on my experience I told before about the didgeridoo that makes some sense uh -huh. to me as yeah. far as using them for storage I, I've never been inside the pyramids or to the pyramids I've seen their scale they're massive 
but right? my under my understanding of the the interior structure is that there are tunnels and then chambers. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't seem to me that I'm not trying to be argumentative or anything like that. Yeah. Just curiosity. It doesn't seem to me that those tunnels and chambers are even large enough to hold seven years worth of grain between three pyramids for all the people in the region. So I don't know, but um, that's, I don't know. I, you know, some of the structure too, um, they have, the pyramids have vent shafts that go up to the different areas. So very easily it could be something where, you know, they would build things up the side where they could carry the grain and just dump it in, um, you know, and then there would be a way to disperse it out through the bottom, almost like a silo where they have an opening um, or can create an opening, um, you know. So from what i am seen or what I believe, I think that initially they were more open or had different chambers almost like cisterns uh, that we see and so the grain would be funneled into those different parts and they would take you know open up bottom parts where they could take that grain out of those chambers and kind of keep rotating through the chambers um, as they were distributing Hmm. and I think as they began to you know use those chambers then for tombs um, you know they closed off those areas that went up further um you know so that it kept the oxygen at a certain level for the mummification okay. but so i think there were modifications that were made as the pyramids were repurposed but that's just how i see it right on well thank you that that can make sense um we'll probably wrap up here soon, but um, what is your favorite is probably not the right word, but uh, what is your most, the the thing you're, you're most excited to share with people, whether it's part of this past testimony or not, what are you most excited to share with people? Absolutely. You know, um, really the work the Lord has given me right now, which is on kingdom living with jesse.com. Um, With that, you know, you've shared that I'm an author and I've written several books. Um, The most dynamic of them so far is His Kingdom Comes in Power. Um, And, you know, that teaches us about the beginnings of the battle, that we are all in this battle with an enemy who, you know, many people have questions. Is Satan real? If he's real, how does he work in our lives? How does he attack us? And how do we become to get to that place where we can overcome him? And then, you know, then we get into the exciting part because um, on my website, you'll find courses, you'll find hours and hours under the conversation tab of videos where I've done, where I instruct on different concepts within kingdom living. Um, You know, I'm very passionate about being hands-on and teaching people how to really live this new life that God's given us. Um, So I encourage people, check it out. Uh, Check out my website. Um, On there, you also see uh, sections, like if you keep uh, checking every now and then, um, I'm going to have conferences that I do uh, coming up. Uh, So probably, you know, mid mid to late March, um, I'll be in Florida, and I'm going to do my second course launch, um, which is going to be uh, the rise of the righteous. And um, so I encourage you to watch the first course before that. Uh, With each course that you get, um, we offer coaching sessions and a time for question and answer. And then we go to the next coaching session where, you know, we're going to go beyond the concepts. We're going to start bringing it to your community and answering your questions as to how, you know, How do we tear up strongholds? How do we pray? How do we intercede? How do we begin to build those relationships with people in our community? So um, that's really what I'm most passionate about. And uh, I have also, you know, shows that are on there weekly every Wednesday and Sunday evenings. And um, those shows are, the first one is called Rise Up. And that's meant to equip. Uh, prepare people in how to live 
And the second one on Sundays is called Riding the Storms. Um, there's a lot in the church that people are afraid to talk about. Uh, they don't want to talk about their temptation. They don't want to talk about, um, you know, their trials, their challenges. Um, so we go there on Riding the Storms. And that show is really meant for, um, you know, giving you resources and tools that are going to help you through those times of challenges, temptations, and trials. So Awesome. That sounds great. And um, thank you so much for, for coming on and doing this. Yeah, and, thank you for um, having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our part two uh, when that comes next month. And um, hopefully I'll have a whole new list of questions by then. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Would you like to close us in prayer? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together, Lord. And I thank you that you love us so much. You are so deeply concerned about our lives and you care about every detail of our lives because from the moment you created us and formed us in the womb, you formed us for a purpose and a destiny. You formed us for greatness in your kingdom that we may rule and we may reign with you. And your desire for our lives is to give us a future and a hope. So we thank you and we praise you for that. And I ask for each one listening today, Lord, um, that you would dispense that special grace, that you would begin to move them into that position of fulfilling that role and that purpose and that destiny that you have created for them. And I ask that you would bless them, that their lives may not be filled with dead or empty works, but that you would release to them the fruit that they are made to bear for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Right at about that point, uh, the audio got cut off during my editing process. I spent <laughs> more hours than I'd like to like to have spent editing this, trying to get the format correct. Um, but that is Jesse Zaboder. If you have any questions about her, her work, her experiences or any questions in general at all, you can find her links in the show notes, or you can email me at the allcast, po- or excuse me, at the allcast inbox at gmail.com. If you have any uh, recommendations or requests for guests, uh, send an email there with um, the person you'd like to like to hear or with the contact information of uh, whoever you, you are recommending. Um, other than that, uh, I look forward to part two with Jesse, and um, I'll see you in the future.